Ah, okay. Yes, yes. Um, welcome on Violet Wood. Um, so tell us more about uh, what's happening with the the ongoing uh, adventure with the Peranakan culture. Will it continue to evolve? And do you think that uh, being a Peranakan or a Nonya, yes. uh, uh, is it does it have a place in society where they can continue to contribute? And what does it mean to be a Nonyang or a modern day man? Um, I think being Nyonya, I, I, I don't I used to live in Katong. Katong is the heartland. I mean if you go there and meet the Pranakas there, it's really still that whole society which is similar, they they're speaking the language which is a Malay Patoa. Uh, the traditions are still very much alive. Um, on on a very family level. How relevant is it? Well, the first generation of leaders in Singapore and even the Chinese leaders in Malaysia were all Pranakans, were all you know, the part of the culture because they were the people who made home in this part of the world. And will it be? I, I think it's, it's a culture that's very um, beautiful and exotic. Uh, we have a Pranakan museum in Singapore, and and it's a culture that is it has enough of a body of uh, art and. I mean, not, it's not really art, but a body of furniture, crockery, uh, and you know, a lifestyle that can have a whole museum to itself. I, I was in Paris in uh, 2010, where the museum Key Bronley had a Pranakan exhibition for a few months, and I went for the opening, and they did a beautiful um, setup. But it's, it's got the, the, the artifacts that we have are very flamboyant and very beautiful and, and the Parisian can feel um, sort of a, a, an attachment to it because it's very much like Jean Paul Gaultier uh, you know that that, 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 that that clash of colors that, that very exotic pattern uh, it's like Versace and it's not a mistake it's, it's not by, by accident because um, the, the Pranakan beaded slippers the nyonyas that used to make the beads were from Venice you know, the, the beaded slippers were Murano and had to be glass beads. So that, that whole exotic lifestyle, which is very Italian-like to a certain extent, you know, uh, very, very, I would say very Rococo. And um, does it have a, a, a relevance in the everyday life? And not really, I mean, you cannot see yourself wearing a sarong kabaya in everyday life. But it's for parties. Uh, the the Pranakas who are in Singapore have their food every day. There are some families which live the life in Singapore, but um, is it evolving? And I don't think I, I don't think I think in, in evolving it may just get lost. Like like my children, the next generation are Singaporeans, you know, and uh, so it's it's not into that. My daughter, when she got married, she wore my mother's wedding kabaya, and there are families that when they have married, when I understand now, they have weddings and the whole. Uh, party of women are dressed in sarong kabayas, which is lovely, which didn't happen to maybe 20 years ago. So, what happens next for you, Miss Violet Wound? You know, uh, everybody now is expecting something new, yeah. like a cookbook. You know, yeah. uh, every is is the most probably the most anticipated uh, oh <laughs> uh, event, I think. Yeah. Uh, and maybe your your new ventures uh, in the coming yeah. months ahead. Um, I think with my food, it's possible to. Mix and match it and modernize. I mean, actually, I, I I go to America a lot, and I love what's happening with food there because, in a way, it's a similar experience of being immigrants, of uh, mixing with so many other cultures, and I think an American chef who is very dynamic and creative is not as tied to his culture, and not as imprisoned to the culture as a French chef, or an Italian chef, or even a German chef. And, and that and, and that um, that freedom allows him to you know like I mean people like Thomas Keller and all that you know allows them to have the most brilliant techniques you know which is European and yet having the, the mind able to leap across the Pacific Ocean to leap across the Atlantic Ocean you know uh, to incorporate uh, Native American ingredients Mexican into their cuisine and this is what I think I do you know because I travel I mean I've been uh, I've been in seven schools. My, my father was transferred to London, Kuala Lumpur. We had experiences in Sabah, you know, like from, from the very native experience to the uh, like jungle ferns to something more, more modern. 
And um, that is, I think, the, the life and the future of where cuisines are going. I mean, you have the very pure cuisines which have a place, for sure. Like a very pure Italian, very pure Pranakan, very pure French. I think should still be there in, in, in all the culture because that is what uh, holds you to what you really are in your past. But I think for a lot of us now, we're just uh, putting together taste and textures and techniques and flavors that we, we encounter in our journey throughout life, you know what I'm saying? And I, I think um, that's what I put together in the meal, you know? When, when, when I, I mean, I, I think we had salmon, which may be modern American, and I would do it with a salad, which is, um, or, or a pickle, which is Filipino and something else. And, and I think um, the palate now is very, um, the, the palate of the modern gourmet wants this excitement of, of a sudden new, new juxtaposition which you never had before. Mm. And I think um, that's what I, I love to do with my food, you know, with my Peranakan food. I'll take a salad and I could blend it with something else. I've, I've served it fine dining style, you know, and, and you, could do, you could do anything to it actually. So, in your new next cookbook, would we, would we expect something uh, right across the Pacific, fusion probably, uh, along with the uh, some form of the piranha kind essence in it? Yeah, my next cookbook has been uh, maybe 10 years in the making. I haven't been as prof prolific as I should have been. I mean, I have a lot of recipes. I have like, uh, somebody's chronicling my recipes. It's up to like maybe 2,000, all tested, you know, and still haven't finished. Uh, my next cookbook is going to going to be um, everything in my life, you know. So from from very genuine Pranakan to leaps across the Pacific to being in Ita Italy, uh, you know, learning something from a Persian friend. And I say I, I cook a very good Persian meal, but I do not cook a Persian cuisine. That means whatever I cook is wonderful, but I'm not a Persian cook. And I think a lot of people cook that way now. And I I would I would try to chronicle. Uh, what, not only Pranakan, but what it was like growing up in Katong, you know. I, I remember, like, we, we were in somewhere called Kochuan Avenue, which still exists, thank goodness. At the end of it was the sea, which is now reclaimed land. And the fishermen would come with their catch, uh, you know, a basket of prawns, and we would wait outside the stoop. And um, my mother would say, okay, let's, you know, get these prawns, and she would cook it just on a bed of onions with some chilies and then and steam on a bit of onions. And it's, I can still remember that flavour. I, I can still remember not only that flavour, that experience. People say mm. that you'll probably be the next uh, Julius, Julius Child uh, of the Far East mm. or even Asia. You know. uh, how do you see that yourself? Do you think it's a compliment? I think it's a compliment, of course. Uh, but. I, I, I don't go out to do anything that I'm doing for a claim or, you know, any of that. It's like, I really love what I'm doing. I, I, I really love to put together, I just put together a cooking competition on family favourites. And I, I love to keep on discovering, you know, that you can only know so much. And every day, if, if you're willing to learn from somebody else, you know, just even that technique and, and sharing. And, and actually, I'm a sociologist. So I actually approach food more from that point of view where what are you learning about people from what they are eating. So right now, here in Singapore, um, do you have any plans uh, for, for your fans who is to come in the next 12 months? You know, do you feel that, uh, that Singapore is ready for uh, a better class of cuisine? Uh, I think Singapore has a, white, a wonderful class of cuisine now, you know. So, I mean, it's, it's like taken a quantum leap in the last 10 years. And I must give credit for organizations like Singapore Tourism Board, who actually have gone out to woo the top chefs to open branches here. We have Wolfgang Park's cut, which I love. And they've managed to translate that whole Californian, Los Angeles, Hollywood sophistication, Beverly Hills, to their restaurant in the Marina Bay Sands. And what has been happening with the, uh, what they call IRs, you know, and, and the restaurants that have been coming in, I think it's amazing, it's very vibrant, and you get a lot of chefs coming here from Italy, from around the world, because this is still a very vibrant economy. 
you know, where, where somehow um, people love to eat out all the time and, and there's, there's business in it, you know. So, so we, we have been attracting a really good quality of chefs and people who cook to come to Singapore. Before we go, someone says, you know, uh, and wonder, what kind of ingredients do you fancy most? You know, I mean, before, before you, if, if you had a second life, what are the ingredients that you would take along with to infuse? Actually, uh, it's very funny what your sentimental food is. When I'm out in Singapore and I'm eating, not, I'm just eating, you know, it's, it's nothing but just eating. And it's a hawker center or a food court. I would invariably choose Malay food, the the, the nasi the nasi Malayu, and I think this has to do with it's it's like it has to do with my childhood where my father would bring me out every Sunday uh, breakfast for a meal of nasi Malayu, and I think I think sentiment has so much um, pull in the person's life. I mean, you know, if if I if I cannot think of anything, I'll eat Malay food, which is quite strange, you know, if you think of it. And I'll be eating like the tsai and the rice. It may not be delicious, but it may be my choice. I mean, I, I and then I will try other food, of course. Last but not least, just to resolve the mystery that mm -hmm. everyone has in mind, they were just wondering, as you are Violet Wu of today, what I, what was the consideration and make and what was the the beginnings of of your adventure becoming a a uh, food ambassador that you are today, you know. I mean, it was said that you were once a journalist yourself. Yeah. You know, m many years ago. Yeah. You know, what caused you to 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 have a sudden a uh, turn you know, of, uh, of of. I'm still career? a journalist, you know. I, mean, uh -huh. I I think that was my own first and only career. I mean, I worked in uh, the Straits Times Group. I mean, I loved it, and um, my first job was music critic, and then. And I have loved to cook, you know, I mean, being, being a Jonya, uh, we are a very gregarious society. So when I learned to cook, I, I learned to cook because my aunt, my mother did not cook, she was liberated. She was a highly high-powered secretary in the 1940s, and so she never cooked. And so when I wanted to eat my Nyonya food, I had to eat my aunt's cooking, my, my father's sister's. And so I asked them to cook for me because I was thinking when they drop dead, what's going to happen, you know. And because there were no restaurants then, you know, and so I learned and, and I really made an effort and I've uh, been Pranakans and, and my father, if you learn to cook, you must cook for people. If you learn to dance, you must da dance for people. If you learn to sing, you must sing for people. And I used to sing, I, I mean, I'm a singer. And you know, I used to dance and I'd be like, made to, okay, come and you know, put on your costume and dance. You know, this is to just any guest. So after the experience, you'll be shameless, you know, there's nothing that embarrasses you anymore. Because your father made you do this. So um, then I, I was cooking for colleagues in the newspapers and then at that time when in 1971 to 74 the colonials were leaving Singapore and the locals were taking over their jobs you know in newspapers and so when the food critic was leaving the country my boss who was David Crawl who was my you know my, my sort of uh, sort of mentor editor in the new in the newspaper called new, new nation said I think we better have somebody who can cook to write the food column so that's how it started and it became like a, first I did reviews, then, then I realized as, as a journalist, you get to see a world which your reader never gets to see. You know, so I thought, let, let me do recipes. So I said, will the chef show me how to cook? And I would say, I will write the recipes in the kitchen. I don't ask for the recipes and I will describe it. And there was no video, there was nothing. And I would write the recipes in the newspaper and share with my readers. And, and I feel the greatest... Um, Duty, the greatest job and the most exciting job of a journalist is to share worlds that you see that people normally don't. And, and you know, and it was sharing, because I, I knew that I could go into a French kitchen, which they cannot. I, I could go to anybody's kitchen as a journalist. And so that's how I started writing recipes. That we, I wanted to share this experience with my readers who wouldn't have the chance. And, and, and I think till today that sharing is so, uh, it's so thrilling, it's very part of what I do actually. What's the role of women today? Now, now that you spoke about uh, yeah. uh, your role mm. uh, during that period, and it still is today. Mm. You know, most people are asking. You know, uh, the role of women seem to be diminishing uh, mm. day by day, mm. and yet uh, many of the men factor mm. you know, don't seem to take uh, acknowledgement of of what the women do for the society. Mm. Uh, how important is this for you, and what do you see the role of women today uh, from? 
from the Southeast Asian perspective and being the non yourself? Actually, I'm the wrong person to ask, but I did, when I was working for a magazine called New Nation, we actually went to the ASEAN countries and, and posed this question, what was the role of women? And that was fun. I, I got to interview women activists and, you know, people who are so active, but I, I, am, I, I'm, I must say I'm not like that. I'm, I'm not into that. And, and I think women, the role of women today in the traditional role as, you know, a mother, caregiver, mm, I think it's becoming more than my time. My time, I, my time was women's lip. And, you know, and the reason I, maybe, I think the reason I stand out was that nobody in my generation wanted to learn to cook because it was seen as bondage. Uh, to, to, to bondage to the home, bondage to a duty which they did not like. Uh, but I'm an only child, so my father brought me up, not as a girl, that I had to serve the men, but I was brought up like a boy, you know, I'm like, I, I should just do things for my own satisfaction and joy. And, and I think I learned to cook the way a man learns to cook. A man learns to cook for fun. A woman learns to cook as a duty. You know, and, and so that's why you get, men are really flamboyant cooks, because it's really for fun. And, and for you know showing off and entertaining people uh, and I'm not sure about Southeast Asia I think I think women in Singapore are definitely very um, they may not be so equal in the boardroom but day-to-day -day life they I think they're much more uh, liberated in a sense than even women in America they're not expected to be uh, super homemakers but that being said my daughter's generation has gone back to being super mothers. They, they are so fantastic compared to my generation. When, when they decide to have children, it's a real um, commitment. And, and it's a real commitment with husband and wife. And you know, the, 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 what, what they do for their children, what they plan is, I think, amazing. And, and they really uh, want to be good mothers. Which, my generation wasn't so dedicated in that, actually. Violet, thank you so much for joining us here at the National Critics' Voice. And we hope that we look forward to your latest new adventure, especially your new cookbook, perhaps, yeah. and, and so on. And, uh, and please uh, do tell your readers, uh, if there, is there a website right now that you have that they could catch up with you? It's very out of date. It's violetwoon.com, but it's like, it hasn't been updated, which I, I'm in the midst of doing something. And I have something called thecookcircle.com which it is, it is a community of cooks which also I'm going to update where, where I'm not calling it chefs because people who cook, we have professional chefs, we have homemakers, we have young women who are professional who love to bake and I think it's, it's just a gathering of a circle of friends who love to cook and love to eat as well. If there's one advice you could give to the next generation, what, what would that be? In food? Yeah. Yeah. I think I, I, I wrote a book called A Singapore Family Cookbook. And I think every family has a cookbook. And I think everybody should chronicle what their grandmother cooks before they... You always hear that they don't bother because the granny is always cooking. And you know, they, have, they, they love foods from their childhood. And when, when at a certain point, the granny becomes too old or see now it's too late, you know? And I, I think especially for an immigrant society, like us in Singapore and America, you, you never realize that your family experience is actually unique to you. It's not, it's not homogeneous like Japan, for example. And if, if you actually write a book of what your family eats and who likes what and aren't, you can actually, it actually traces your family history. And, and I really do think that family should because uh, you, you may come from, your, your ancestors may have come from a certain village and what you're eating may be very normal to you, but actually it's not normal. It's, it's, it's a very specific to a certain town or a village. That's why I think people should write their own good books. Well, thank you, Ms. Violet Wood. And thank you, uh, my viewers. And please do check out her website and have a great day.